What's up, everybody? Chris Flick here, Chris Flick Podcast, episode number 110. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about a book titled War is a Racket by, by the great Smedley Butler. Butler, the author of this book, wrote this in the late 1920s. He was born in 1881 to a prominent Quaker family right outside of Westchester, Pennsylvania, which is not too far from here. He was educated in the Quaker system, the Friends school system. This is the same school system that my young daughter goes to and is being educated in 100 years later. He spent 34 years in the Marine Corps. He was shot at over 120 times. He was awarded the Medal of Honor twice. He was the first of 19 men to do so, to be awarded that way. Upon his retirement, he cared so much about his men that he gave handwritten maps to each and every one of them in case they ever needed anything they knew how to get to his home. This book that he wrote, War is a Racket, is not an anti-soldier book. If anybody was for the soldier, it was this man. It's an anti-war book because of the motivations that go by leading his own countrymen into war. At the time that he wrote this book, and at the time that he got out of military service, his approach, his mindset reminded me of the Dylan Thomas poem. He would not go gentle into that good night. He would rage, rage against the dying of light. He used his voice, he used his power, and he used his, um, his ability to, um, his influence really, to make it, make it known, make it aware of certain things that happened in his mind in the early 1900s that are still happening today. 1931 Memorial Day speech, what I talked about earlier in the previous episode, I have only one sentiment for soldiers, cheers for the living and tears for the dead. If anybody cared about soldiers, anybody cared about soldiers more than Smedley Butler, at the time of this writing, I would be totally shocked. As we go on in this book, he opens it. War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses of lives. How is that for how about that for an opening? This is a fifty plus page manual of his thoughts on the issues he sees in war, and then the three ways that he thinks he can kind of correct it. Butler goes on to say, as long as there are wars, which means as long as human nature endures. In his mind, as long as human beings are on this earth, there's gonna be war, there's gonna be conflict, there's gonna be issues, locally, nationally, internationally. As long as there's human pride and selfishness and the age old death struggle between right and might, just so long, while honest, decent, civilized men and women have to fight the forces of greed, power, wealth, and man's natural sinfulness. Nations are like people. Some try to lead honorable lives. Some are untrustworthy. Some are like rats. He goes on to write, It isn't the army that causes war. People cause war, and the army stops it. So this influence from the outside, from these individuals, what is at the root of every war? It's certain people, right? People cause these conflicts. There's these historical figures throughout the years, right? There's always names associated with how things start. People start conflict, and it's the army that comes in and has to finish it. World War I was labeled the war to end all wars. Butler's response to that? Yeah, right. He wrote this book just as the Nazi uprising was starting to happen, all right? Um, mid to late 1920s is when he starts putting this stuff down on paper, maybe gets published in 1930. Hitler's starting to come to power shortly after that. Each nation is studying and perfecting newer and ghastlier means of annihilating its foes wholesale. That's still going on today with technology going on. This is before World War II. This is before the atomic bomb. This is before napalm. This is before all that stuff. All of these things that became devastating um, effects of war. Butler saw this stuff coming, and then even now, he would be shocked at what is going on today. You know, we have the, some of these countries allegedly have the ability to like, send these missiles, what appears to look like it's heading for Chicago, and then just kind of veer and dive in towards New York City, something like that. Gaslier means of annihilating populations. That's what some of these countries are going into. Um, I mean, our country's included in that. If you listen to the Great Book or read the Great Book by Malcolm Gladwell, The Bomber Mafia, he talks about how what our country did to Japan. 
just hammering them with napalm, 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 burning towns to the ground. They literally invented napalm because of the stickiness factor and because these Japanese cities were so tightly packed, they knew that if they could start a fire on a block and if this stuff, and if the fire um, hung around for a little bit, it didn't just extinguish, that they could just do dev devastating things to, to these neighborhoods and these cities. This was before that they, they dropped the bomb on it. They were just kind of hammering that area with napalm. And he goes on to say, yeah, right about being the end, the war to end all wars. Why does he say that? It pays high dividends. During that time from 1914 to 1918, the DuPonts, right? It could be the shadiest American company in the history of American companies. Their profits were 10 times during the war years, the non-war years. The Bethlehem Steel went from $6 million. Bethlehem's right down the road from here. It employed so many people in this area. But Bethlehem Steel, six million to forty-nine million during the the war years. That was their profit. Estimated fifty-two billion dollar cost of World War One. Thirty-nine used in war. Sixteen left over in profits. Butler goes to say, "Does war pay?" Question mark. It paid them. Exclamation point. How many of these war millionaires shouldered a rifle? How many of them were wounded or killed in battle? So I say, to hell with war. That's the that's the ending of the book, right? To hell with war all in caps. He lets, it, he lets it be known, man. Just remember that poem I brought up earlier. Gentle into that good night, rage, rage against the dying light. Our boy Butler was about rage. He wasn't going to go gently. Now he's talking about the soldier. It's the soldier that pays the bills. They pay with their life, they pay with their health, they pay with their mental state. These men caught in the cauldron of war lost their youth almost overnight. The man who battled with the element at sea crept forward on their stomachs under a hail of bullets, suffered the only irreparable losses that wars create when they sacrifice their bodies, their normal outlook on life, and their youth. This is the soldier. Through mass psychology, they were entirely changed. We used them for a couple of years and trained them to think nothing at all of killing or, or being killed. Then suddenly, we discharged them and told them to make another about face. This time, they had to do their own readjusting. Sans mass psychology, sans officer's aid, sans nationwide propaganda. They had no help. The systems weren't there for the soldiers when they got out of war. They were literally fighting in muck and water and trenches with their comrades and maybe dead right next to them with rats in there and all that other stuff, right? And literally, in less than 60 seconds after they received their final discharge, we again regarded them as civilians. Although they were given intensive training in the art of becoming killers, we gave them no help or training in their readjustment mentally and psychologically to the ways of peace. This is in the 1920s. Now, we're starting to see the effects of this stuff. Um, you know, with things like post-traumatic stress disorder being at, at these huge alarming rates. There was nothing, there was no systems in place for these people. These soldiers that put their lives on the line for their country. In lieu of all that, there's a con there's a common bond of comradeship that can never be dissolved by religious or political differences. In lieu of all these negative things, that brotherhood that he had with his fellow soldiers was nothing that was was something that could not be replicated in any, any other area in life. He believed that these soldiers, these former soldiers that are back home now, should become the leaders of the movement for world peace. This is the only group of citizens that can hope to inspire and attract the moral support and the confidence of the people as a whole. He said if anybody was going to be able to push peace, it's going to be the men and women that fought for their country. Because they know the effects of war. And when it goes on to the decision makers, these are the people that aren't over there in the trenches. These are the people that don't have a hail of bullets flying over their head. These are the people that spend their nights in their beds in nice cozy temperatures. Stateside. When diplomats, statesmen, and politicians are gathered around those tables, you can be sure the dove of peace is only a vulture in disguise. Reminds me of, you know, uh, stuff just throughout the decades, man. I remember reading Malcolm X's autobiography, and he talked about uh, the racist versus the non -racist. The racist, he said he liked the people from the South. He's like, because they told, they told him, they told him what they were thinking. It wasn't nice stuff, but they didn't disguise it. They weren't like the northern racists who pretended to their face that they had their back, but behind closed doors didn't have their back. At this time, with this war time, the dove of peace is only a vulture in disguise. The dove of peace is the lip service that the politicians were given with their, you know, the diplomats, the, the statesmen, all those people. It was all lip service, but behind closed doors, 
they were vultures in disguise. These same people aren't running any risk of being killed or of having their bodies mangled or their minds shattered. They aren't sleeping in the muddy trenches. They aren't hungry. The soldiers are. When you listen to some well-worded, well-delivered war speech, just remember it's nothing but sound. It's your boy that matters. And no amount of sound can make up to you for the loss of your boy. Do you want him to be the next unknown soldier? Only those who would be called upon to risk their lives for their country should have the privilege of voting to determine whether the nation should go to war. In essence, if you or someone in your immediate family is enlisted, you get, you get a say in the matter. And if they're not, if you're not enlisted, if your son's not enlisted, if your brother's not enlisted, you're not gonna have the same, a say in the matter. Because in his mind, these people that are making decisions over there in their ivory tower, so to speak, they don't have any skin in the game. Because they don't have skin in the game, he doesn't feel that like they should be the ones making decisions. Ultimately, too, because he felt that they were making profits. So Butler goes on. How do you eliminate war? Number one, we must take the profit out of, out of war. We can never hope to remove the profit to war until Congress passes the necessary legislation. An unbridled desire for money and power will destroy any leadership, and the continuation of dishonest leadership will eventually wreck any form of government. How about that, huh? He's like a seer, like he's seeing this stuff happen 100 years before we're at this point now. Dishonest leadership will eventually wreck any form of government. Number two, we must permit the youth of the land who would bear arms to decide whether or not there should be war. He was a soldier for over 30 years. He said there was nothing that could replace that. That comradeship, that brotherhood, all of that stuff that he had. In lieu of all the negativity, it was still one of these great moments of his life. It is what made him who he was. We must limit our military forces to home defense purposes. He's writing this at a time when like I mentioned earlier, Hitler's power is starting to come to rise. This war is in Europe, it isn't over here, and it won't come over here unless we invite it. He then shares a story. Now, I mean, we think about what's going on with Russia and Ukraine right now. That war is over there, it's not here. Butler gives a great example of a back alley situation where if you stumble upon a fight between two people, right, which is say what was going on back then in Europe and also let's just say Russia and Ukraine right now, you have these two countries battling in a back alleyway, Putin and Zelensky, right, fighting. You say, hey, I'm not gonna get, I'm not getting involved in this fight, you guys have to settle this, but I'm gonna give Ukraine a bunch of weapons, a bunch of technology, and a bunch of resources to beat Putin. You pick the side. You can't say you're not in the game, you're in the game. Back to Butler. They say, well, if the French and British don't like Hitler, he will be over here and jump on our necks. Don't let anybody feed you that rot. In his mind, the resources it would have taken to move German soldiers, hundreds of thousands of them, in boats, in planes, whatever it may be, across the sea, across the ocean, into American soil, he didn't believe that that would happen. And then, well, and also he knew that they would be coming. We would know that they would be coming. The second part of it is like, okay, fine, they wanna move somewhere close, like say, whatever, Cuba. They still have to do the same moving, and now instead of going straight to our lands, they have to go to Cuba first and then come over. The mass transit of all those people was not likely in his mind. In his experience, he said not happening. And then he also brings up the question here, how often are we going over there to bail out Europe? So many families that he's worked with, so many men and women that he's lost. How many more of our greatest human beings, basically? Are we going to be willing to sacrifice, put on the line, in order to bail out Europe? Looking back on his time, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was to operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. All of his missions that he went to into these different countries, these different areas, um, he was overseeing operations just so America can make more profits. That's what led him to be disgruntled. This is an interesting point. Dictatorships, this is written 100 years ago, and I remember that. Dictatorships begin with press censorship. The best insurance against dictatorship is a free and independent press. This is the battle we're still fighting today. When he gave his Memorial Day speech in 1931, he said, 
And we as true men, we need to faithfully fight the battles of our day as they fought the battles of their day. One of these battles was press, and it was free and independent press. These are some of the battles that we need to fight today because of what they've done for us back in the day. Smedley Butler and 34 years of his service and every other serviceman from, you know, 1776 and beyond. We need to continue to fight for the things that we truly believe in because they did it. We have now nearly the wealth of half the world with but a 20% of the population. And 25% of our people are in dire distress, if not actual hunger. That's what that, Those are the numbers when he wrote this. You look around in America today, the divide is growing. It's getting larger, right? We have the haves and the have-nots. And I'm saying that in a way, I'm saying that as part of the have-not group. I'm not, I'm not this 1% individual, right? I'm not making uh, laughable, you know, FU type money, all right? I enjoy my life, I enjoy our resources, and I'm better off than a large portion of the population. There's so many people out there that need stuff, whether it's mentally, psychologically, maybe they even need food. How could we have an abundance of calories in this country? Obesity being a freaking pandemic in itself. An endemic, whatever you want to call it. But yet we have people starving at the same time. How does that happen? We don't know. Greed. Lastly, Butler. A well-organized minority can always outmaneuver an unorganized majority. This is something we need to keep in mind. Hitler himself became the seventh member of the Nazi Socialist, whatever the hell, the National Socialist Party, whatever the Nazi group was. He was the seventh member. So he went from being the seventh person to sign up, one of seven, to lead in that, to creating a world war. It's people that start wars. Remember that. It's the, arm, it's the army that ends them, but it's people that start them. We can't let those people start them. Smedley Butler prominent American. You know, you look up this man, too, there's not a ton of information. This book's eye-opening. I recommend it to anybody. If you're interested in, in history, it's 50-some pages of, of great content by one of the greatest, most decorated soldiers in American history. Hope you guys have a great day. War is a racket. This podcast is on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and maybe another spot or two that I just can't recall right now. ChrisFluck.net's the website. You can go there and join our newsletter. There, it's a lot of fitness stuff, right? I work with kids. This podcast here, everything that we're doing here is just kind of in support of all the programs that we offer here at the farm. We have kids, you know, we have a Jumpstart program where we get young kids active all the way to found a fundamentals course with an emphasis on fun to um, intro to training which is teaching kids about physical fitness and exercise to strength and conditioning for athletics, um, all that stuff, right? This podcast, the support, keep liking, keep sharing. Have a great day, guys. Peace, everybody.